friends, welcome to the Alkane Reptile Girl with me, Annalise. Have you ever wondered how smart are snakes? I mean, they can't learn tricks. They don't know their names, although I do have my doubts about Hobbs. They can't be housebroken, and they can't help me with my homework. To most people, they seem pretty dim, right? Today we will be talking about the intelligence of our scaly friends, and find out if they are actually as dumb as people think they are. Here's a hint, they're not. It's been long thought that snakes aren't terribly bright, and that's true, at least not in the way that we perceive intelligence. Take a look at this meme. I think that this sentiment absolutely applies to snakes as well. Uh, but not in the way that they can climb trees, they can do it quite well. But it, uh, you get what I'm saying. <laughs> they don't have the most sophisticated brain, and yes, they do lack some of the cognitive or emotional power that us brainy mammals and even some other reptiles have. But once you understand how they see the world, you can better understand how they think and behave, and how they view the world is actually kind of clever. I'm being extremely clever up here and there's no one to stand around looking impressed. What's the point in having you all? Some people swear that their snakes love them, or come when they're called, or are smarter than some other pet, or a family member. It is very easy for us to assign our thought process onto our snakes and find intelligence that's not really there. It doesn't mean that they lack intelligence, but it does mean that the smart behavior we think we're seeing isn't actually what it is. Snakes are just wired differently from us and operate according to a few basic decision-making drivers. Those drivers are danger, food, shelter, and reproduction. In other words, they organize their world into a few yes or no questions. Will this hurt me? Can I eat this? Can I hide here? Or can I mate with this? A yes to any of these will drive a reaction. Let's ask our newest snake, my beautiful doom rolls boa, Tassara, how she sees this rat. Hey sweetie, is this rat dangerous? No, not delicious, dangerous. Okay, can you eat it? Can you hide under or on it? Okay, last question, honey. Can you mate with it? So, what are you gonna do? Thank you to Sarah, that was very helpful. You're my good, beautiful girl. Okay, let's ask my little valley garter snake, Dwight, the same question. Do we get? Look at that rat. Can it hurt you? Could you eat it? Could you hide under or on it? Okay, could you mate with it? So, what's your plan, little one? Now, Dwight, you're still pretty new here and naturally a little more anxious than some of our bigger snakes. Let's talk about the first time you met me. Did you think I would hurt you? Did you think you could eat me? So, was I something safe that you could hide in or on? What about mating? So, what was your course of action there? I know, 
buddy. We'll get there. Through proper, consistent handling, we can condition our snakes to say no to question number one, am I dangerous? And yes to question number three, am I something safe to hide in or on? They stop seeing us as a threat and instead something safe, putting them at ease. Depending on species, breeding, history, and natural temperament, how soon that happens varies from snake to snake. Valley garters are naturally more nervous and it will take a long time before he will feel very comfortable with me. Although he has calmed down quite a bit and I think we're getting there. Dumeril's boas like Tassara or ball pythons like everybody's best buddy Monty here are notoriously even tempered and get there a lot sooner. Okay, Monty, when we first met, did you think I would hurt you? Did you think dad would hurt you? What about mom? Did you think she would hurt you? Hmm, I'm sensing a pattern here, Monty. What do you think of people in general? By understanding how snakes view their world, we can better understand, predict, and modify their behavior. We have a lot of trust with Monty, and I can go days, or probably even weeks without handling him, and we can pick up right where we left off. I can even make the occasional mistake and not have to worry about eroding that trust. With Dwight, I need almost daily short, positive interactions with him to build up that trust. And with the smallest little slip, could send us right back to square one. Hobbs, our Macklitz Python, gives us another great example of this decision matrix in action. He is perfectly comfortable using us as his personal trees, just like Monty here, but he has been hook trained since before we adopted him. He usually comes out when we open the door. But if not, we need to tap him with the hook and use this to start to pull him out. If we just reach him with our hands and start to grab him, he gets visibly upset. And he will try to run back into his enclosure until we get him out and he calms down. We joke that he is offended that we dare touch him with our filthy mammal hands. But that is just us projecting our emotions onto him. The reality is that the change in routine resets his decision path. The hook in his tank is what he associates with us wanting to take him out to socialize with him. He does not associate our hands in that way. Instead of already knowing that we are not a threat and are a safe way for him to explore outside of his apartment, he has to re-figure out that we are not a danger and are in fact his safe human friends. It does not take him long though. Good energy and slow movements, and he settles right down. But there's still a big difference in his demeanor when we take him out with the hook versus by hand. This decision path is a great way for us to understand how our scaly friends think and for us to make sure that we are speaking the same language. How they perceive various objects in their environment will vary based on the snake and their personality. Snakeality? Which they have a lot more of than people give them credit for. It is still a surprise to me the distinct likes and dislikes that each of them have, even within the same species. Some hate having their tail touched. Some just don't care. Some like to be left alone when they're in blue. Others, like Monty, who has been shedding all day and slowing down production, don't mind being handled. Just like all creatures, they all have their own preferences, and many of them are based on past experiences that will guide a yes or no response. The parts of the brain that process emotions <laughs> My emotions! My emotions! doesn't really exist in snakes, so it's less like a memory, like ours, and more of just a simple association. 
Every time big creature takes me out, nothing bad happens. Equals big creature is okay. Or big creature swings me around like a lasso every day and I do not like it. Equals big creature is bad. You get the idea, right? Negative events result in negative associations. The frequency and intensity of the negative events will determine how hard it is for you as your snake's keeper to overcome them. For instance, we know someone who has a Doomerol's bow like Tassara, and their Doomerol's had a bad run-in with a rat a few years ago with the previous owner. To this day, she will not eat rats. She'll gobble up mice like candy, but she sees and smells a rat as a very big and loud yes to question number one, which, if you recall, is can this hurt me? And she flees. The personality slash memory part of snake intelligence is where I think we have the most to learn. And we are starting to understand that better too. It was first thought that snakes did not form any social bonds, but studies are putting that into question. In my garter snake video, I talk about a study on the social aspect of garter snakes and how previously established pairs will reunite after years apart and immediately reform that original partnership. You can watch that video right here if you'd like. Not only do they develop bonds with each other, but they can remember that bond years later. That is impressive and far beyond what should be possible given the brain structure of these animals. We know what happens, but not really how, yet. And that is so exciting. Right now, it looks like that social pairing is unique to garter snakes, but who knows what we're gonna learn as we keep studying them more. For all we know, they could be linked telepathically, making fun of all the silly stuff we do every single day. I like to think that we just don't get these guys yet, and that they are capable of deep emotions and attachments. Of course they love and need me, right? I like to think that, but as of right now, the science tells us that despite the hilarious things we make our snakes say in the captions on our videos, they don't really love me or even particularly like me. At best, I'm something they trust as safe, like their favorite hide or a branch in their enclosure. That's actually pretty awesome. To them, they should see me as nothing more than a big scary monster and a terrifying predator. The fact that they trust me as much as they do is extremely high praise. And you know what? I'll take it. That's it for today. Thanks for watching me, the Alcanea Reptile Girl, and my reptiles, of course. Please don't forget to check out my other videos. And as always, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. And remember, nurture all nature. See you next time. Bye. Trying to murder me with your mind? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's happening. <laughs> there are pieces of Monty everywhere. <laughs> don't do that! That is creepy! You're like... <laughs> Ups, our Macklitz python is another... My lip got caught in my brace. It's like in my spring. Date here. Okay, you can go on that side, I guess. Yes, okay, okay. No, don't you get Tasara! Are you in a mood? Okay, um hmm. She's like, I'm hungry, I know I get fed tomorrow. Alright, nope. Oh, mm -hmm. Okay, you can just have that part of your body off the table. Okay, that's fine. Alright. Now I've forgotten my lines.